Now, I'm going to today explain to you a little bit about the history of photography, to show you some cameras, and finally, to make a very simple type of photograph, which we call a photogram. I'm going to start off by telling you something that we all know ever since the dawn of humanity. People have been interested in recording what they see. And I'm holding up here in this wonderful book here, it's called The History of Art by H.W. Uh, Janssen. And in this book here we have two reproductions of beautiful ancient paintings. They're found on the walls of caves, one in Australia, one in France. And the one on the left shows a, it's entitled The Black Bull, and by gum it's a jolly decent image of a black bull. Uh, black bull. And the image, would you believe it, is about 12 thousand years old. The one on the right hand side is called the hunter or the dancer, it's not exactly clear, but I think no one can dispute that these are remarkably good images. Now they show the huge interest that we as humans already had that time 10, 15,000 years ago, and I'm sure that people, thank you Oscar, Oscar's just going to take the book away from me, already in those times people had huge interest in representing what they saw. Now throughout history there have been, I believe, two types of image that people have liked to make. I think few of us will dispute that. One of the images is an image which accurately represents what you see, and the other image is the image which represents what you see, but with your own personality imposed on what you're actually doing. So that, I would say, is the creative aspect of it, and the other one is the rational aspect, where you simply are trying to record something exactly as it looked. For instance, if you wanted to record a picture of a flower exactly how it looked, as many, many botanists did two, three, four hundred years ago, naturalists, they used to draw exact diagrams of what they saw for people to see how they looked some centuries later on. Whereas the other side of art, of course, is the side where the imagination plays a great role. And there we have the development of, of painting, sculpture, all forms of art throughout the ages. And these were, of course, very well documented. And I'm not going to go into that field any further today. I am going to focus on the way in which people have attempted to record real things exactly as they have seen them. The problem with that, as I'm sure you all will recognise, is that to draw something, if I gave, let's say, the same plant to 20 different people and say, could you please draw this as accurately as you can? This is the sort of thing that happens in art lessons, it's called in any case then you know that there will be 20 slightly different variations on that theme. And different people who have different levels of skill, different levels of, of their, their imagination, how they would represent something. So we'd always end up with something which looks, uh, looks pretty similar, but actually then you'd still say, well, what actually exactly did it look like? if that was the question that you were interested in. Now, because people continuously try to improve things and to, um, and, and to make things better, this field is something that people were particularly keen to improve on. How can we make a permanent image an exact image? Well, one of the great steps forward in this field was the development of the pinhole camera, the camera obscura, as it is known. And I have here a book called The Pictorial History of Photography, you see. And in this book, you will not be surprised to know, there is a very, very elegant diagram of a large-scale pinhole camera. Now, you may have done these in your science lessons. Of course, it's a popular topic, much smaller scale. But this, you see, was a very, very good form of um, someone being able to represent, let's say, a tree or, a, or some sort of a landscape because they were able to, um, they were able to go into a, a room which was darkened. The image would be projected onto some sort of paper through a very small hole in, in, in the wall or the, the cloth which whatever was the, the, uh, the camera obscura was made of, pinhole candles, and then they would spend some time drawing the image. And that image we know would be exact because it would be going along the outlines of the shadow. However, 
you know yourselves that this will take a long time to draw an image like this will take probably a few hours maybe there were skilled people and who could do it more rapidly but this was painstakingly long and so people looked for ways of making a more permanent image now one observation which had been made during the middle ages when people the alchemists were experimenting with metals and metal compounds and dissolving them in acids is that certain substances seemed to darken or definitely darkened on exposure to light. They got darker. Now, those substances we know were the compounds of silver. Today, it is well known, and it was already well known then, that compounds of silver got darker on exposure to light. Now, why is that? Because they were decomposing to actually make small amounts of metallic silver. If you go in the chemistry department and you look to see where all the solutions are stored in the cupboard, you will notice that there is one solution that is stored in a brown bottle, a dark brown bottle, and that is silver nitrate solution. It's stored in a dark brown bottle in order to prevent it from being decomposed by light. You also may have done, if you haven't done it already, it's certainly on the surface, an experiment where you burn a piece of magnesium ribbon, which produces a very bright intense light over some freshly precipitated silver bromide and the silver bromide darkens in color. The reason why it darkens is because silver at silver ions in silver bromide, Ag+, are converted into silver atoms, metallic silver. Now the silver ions have no color but silver atoms are dark. They're, they're basically silver, where this metallic silver is black, and or black or shiny in a larger amount. But tiny, tiny, tiny particles appear to be black, and so that then is the a basic photochemical reaction, and that to this day underlies the science of black and white photography using chemical techniques. Now, scientists. Natural philosophers attempted to exploit this reaction of silver to make a permanent image. And I have to tell you that below this diagram of the camera obscura, it's a very poor quality image, I'm sorry to say, but it shows the first photograph that was ever taken. It was taken by the French scientist, natural philosopher, Nicéphore Niepce in 1826, and shows the view looking out over his window, um, in wherever it was that he lived. And that, you see, when that photograph was made for the first time, a permanent image that set off a whole new rave of a new type of phenomenon that people got terribly excited about. And that was, of course, photography, the art and science of photography. Now, I might tell you at the same time that at the beginning of the 19th century, there were two other fields of science and technology which gave rise to a huge amount of interest throughout the world. One of these was steam engines and steam power, our ability to travel by using steam power. And the second was also our ability to travel but through the air. Balloons filled with hydrogen and with hot air, there were two types of balloon that were widely used and exploited. These also became the rave of the 19th century. So science and technology gave us three types of activity that we humans indulged in on a great scale. Traveling by air, traveling by railway, and photography. And it's photography that I'm going to continue to focus on for the rest of our short meeting today. Now, photography, of course, once the chemistry had been developed or understood to a certain extent, immediately people said, say, brilliant, can we make now a, a way of making these images on a large scale, making them more quickly, more rapidly, exposing the, uh, the, the make, making a, a, some sort of a, a plate or a film or something to expose our image on? 
and we're using less and less light and can we also have different types of ways of recording images and by that I mean using different optical devices called lenses. Now it was here of course that the physicists came in. The science of optics is a sub-science of physics and then also the science of mechanics, another subsection of physics, mechanics, how things fit together, and of course that will combine with material science, what materials do you make these devices for. And of course we then have the development of the modern camera. Now I have here to show you an example of a camera. This is a camera from the early part of the 20th century and I bought this especially to show you and to be able to explain a little bit about how it works and you'll see it is a most beautiful camera indeed. It's made of wood, of mahogany and if you don't mind me I'm just going to show you how you can make it take a photograph. So what you do is you have a little beautiful purple pom-pom down there on the end of a string. You pull it like like this oh, and now you see we've cocked the shutter and now when you pull this here you'll notice it suddenly the pom-pom goes up et voila and there you see you would have taken a photograph now that will have operated a compure shutter in there which is a special device for allowing light to go in and out and that would have taken your photograph but what would it have taken your photograph on that's the next question well i can tell you it would have taken a photograph on a piece of photographic film which i have here and this here dear children this is a plate holder it's especially my it's especially made for holding a photographic plate now look how beautifully it's made. It's made of mahogany. It's veneered. It has everything about it to make it look beautiful. And do you know what? I pulled this out just 15 minutes ago and I noticed that it was looking a little bit a little bit, um, the surface was a little bit matte and dirty. So do you know what? I thought I may as well in front of you just polish this up, give it a little polish. So I've got some furniture polish here and I'm going to just quickly polish this off just to make the beauty of this even more apparent to you. Now, can you imagine saying, so, so you know, someone taking a photograph in, back in the 1910 or 1920s, uh, sorry, Dad, I'm just going to polish the film holder. Can you imagine anything more ridiculous than that? Well, you see, people take great pride in what they make. This is beautifully made, handcrafted, etc. And now I'm feeling quite proud. Not only does this look much more beautiful, this side looks actually considerably better than this side. It's more polished. But not a, it has a wonderful smell. These polishes, once again, I do like smells, and I have to say, ah, smells absolutely perfect. So what do we have in here? Just to show you how it works, we now, you see, if I take this out, you see inside here, now the plate goes in there, and then you close this down. This is done, of course, in a dark room, and then we have special clips, etc. I'm not going to explain this to you today, and I'll tell you why because that's going to be the topic for next week. I'm actually going to take a photograph with a camera just like this, and we shall develop it and do everything in front of your own eyes inside this room here. So that's for next week's topic, is the use of a camera like this. It's this one. Yeah, I'll tell you more about that later. But this is probably the oldest camera I've got. This one here, about 1910. And this one here, also about 1910. But we'll be talking about that, as I said, next week. Now, I'm going to just fairly quickly go through the cameras which I've got here to show you um, how, how maybe a little bit about how the history of photography has developed through our improved knowledge of both chemistry and physics and that includes optics, of course. And here you see, I have a camera which was very popularly used in the 1920s. It's a Voigtlander, and as you can see, it is very, very compact indeed. And I'm sure that you look at this and you say, well, how on earth does it work? You see, it's not a sort of camera that you'd say, oh, let's take a photo. You can see, ah, oh, Harry, I just found something here. And you say, but you say, well, that surely, that's not, not to take a photo. Allow me to show you how this, because I have to say I spent quite a lot of time trying to work out. Well, I was given this, by, by the way, by a friend. In fact, I was given quite a few cameras by friends. They, they're what is known as obsolete technology. Apart from people wanting to collect them, there is really no great, um, there is no great merit in having them. But they can still take very good pictures. Now, I'm going to do the magic thing, press a little button there, and bingo, out pops the camera. And here now, we now pull this out, a beautiful, 
beautiful lens there, bellows here, etc. Um, we've got quite a few devices on here. Um, there is a, 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 once again, a focal plane shutter which goes around and you cock it by pulling that. Et voila. And what is it? Isn't that wonderful? So every time there's a spring inside, we have the pressure of a mechanic. And if you want to take a photo with it, then you can push this up and this, and you can look through this. This is the viewfinder. Can you imagine a very, very basic viewfinder? No optics, no nothing fancy at all. That's how you look for it. And then the next question is, well, where's the film? Where do you put things in? Well, this is what we have on the back here, you see. On the back here, I have something which is called a film holder. I can pull this off. I'm going to just li literally pull it off a little bit. But the honest truth is, I have another film holder here, you see, and the, uh, there is a, a matte, uh, piece of matte glass there. We open this up like, oh, this is rather, this is actually the focusing screen. Sorry, this is the focusing screen, and that there was the film holder. But once again, I will be explaining how this works in more detail next week. Now, you see, with this type of camera, I'm sure you will all readily agree that taking a photograph would have been quite a palaver. See, if you wanted to take a photograph or some photographs with this, you say, how many photographs can you take in a day? You wouldn't see how many photographs can I take in a second, how many can I take in a day? And a photographic expedition, if you wanted to take some photos, was a considerable hoo-ha. You had to take the camera, you had to take a special tent to develop the place, the chemistry, etc. There were specialists who did this, of course, but the honest truth is, it was, it was a very time-consuming process. And people, we humans, we've always wanted to improve this. Well, can we take faster photos, more photos, etc., etc., etc.? Now, in the 19th century, photographs were taken initially on metal plates. There was a Frenchman called Daguerre who developed this technique. There was an Englishman called Fox Talbot. They were both brilliant chemists and, of course, brilliant physicists. They were scientists of the highest order, and they utilized their knowledge of physics and of chemistry to develop the mechanics of the camera, the optics of the camera, and the chemistry of the actual process. And together, they went forward. Now, it took about a hundred years, over a hundred years, and photography continued to evolve before we had the invention of the first type of miniature camera. Now, miniature cameras were cameras which were much smaller and which were capable of taking a much larger number of photographs. And here I have such a miniature camera. This is a Russian camera. It's called a Zoriki S, but it's based on a Leica. The Leica's the German camera. Leica's were the great cameras of the 1930s. We're looking about the 1930s, so I said it's slightly over a century from the first photographic image to the miniaturization of the photographic process. So this is, I'm sure no one will dispute the fact that this is a very small camera, but what's interesting, this can take a large number of photographs in a relatively short space of time. Now, in order to do that, we had to use a photographic film. This is a, an Ilford photographic film. Can I tell you, by the way, all this stuff is still available for those of you who aren't using this type of film already. And the, the film goes inside here. You put the film inside the camera like that, you see, and I will just very quickly take the back off the camera just to show you because it really is quite straightforward. You would take the back off the camera, you would slip your film in there, and then you have the various winding. There are the knobs here which you twiddle and the film goes on. And also you could take the, the lens, by the way, it's a, re a lens with a retractable part to it like this, you see, so it goes in and out like that. But you see, in those days, when this type of photography was emerging, you had to understand quite a few things. You had to understand the concept of focusing, depth of focus, shutter speeds, and aperture. There were four vital factors of science which you had to understand. They were not very difficult. I got this camera when I was 16 years old, and I rapidly learned to use the camera, and I will be showing you some results, hopefully at future meetings, of the, the, of the work which I did with this camera. Now, the advantage, as I said, of this camera was, was much faster than these cumbersome devices, and you could take 36 photographs on one film. So you'd, you'd twiddle it on, then you'd press the button, 
You see, they hardly hear. It's very quiet indeed. And you, I'm sure you will agree, this actually is not much bigger than today's cameras. This will slip into your pocket. And the person who used to slip this into his pocket and used to take the most renowned photographs of all time was the great French photographer, Henri Cartier-Bresson. Now, Henri Cartier-Bresson is one of my most favorite photographers. I have for many hours looked at albums of his photographs. Henri Cartier-Bresson lived from 1908 until 2004. He was 96 when he died. Now, he was extraordinary because his photographs were all made using, or a large number of them were made using exactly that type of camera. It was a miniature camera, and his, he, he, he's known as a humanist photographer. He photographed humans in their natural surroundings and in their natural habitats. These are unposed photographs. He used natural light. He he did not crop his photographs. What he photographed was exactly what he produced. And I'm just literally selecting a few random photographs. He was a very, very distinguished photographer. You can read all about him. It's well worth reading about him. And you see, he became famous because he was able to use such a camera as this and not be noticed by people. He was called a humanist photographer because he used to photograph people when they weren't expecting. And do you know what he used to do? He used to cover his camera with black tape in order that it wouldn't gloss, so people wouldn't shine or wouldn't reflect light, so people wouldn't be aware of the type of photographs that he was taking. Now, I have to say that I have also taken many photographs without knowing about his work of a similar nature, and I hope to show you some of these uh, at, at a future meeting. So this, as I said, this is a Zorki S, it's a Russian copy of a Leica, and this is the one of the most famous types of camera that the world has known. Indeed, these fetch very, very significant prices uh, for camera collectors, of which I am not an example. I just simply have them because I use them. Now, as time, the, one of the problems with this, you see, was, as I told you, was focusing, was understanding how depth of light worked, and also you had to look through a, a viewfinder where you weren't actually looking through the lens. You see, if you look through the viewfinder there, all you saw what came out of there. Now, obviously, it was the same as what the lens saw, but it never is exactly the same thing. So, technologists went on to develop a new type of a camera where you could actually see what you were photographing through the lens. And this type of camera was called a single lens reflex camera. It made use of prisms. And here I have an example of a single lens reflex camera like this, you see, um, where you have a prism and you look through. Now, this is a very unusual type of camera. It was made in East, manufactured in East Germany it's shortly after the Second World War. And it's called an exactor. And what's unusual about it? Well, to start off with, it's left handed so in other words everything you do is left-handed and secondly it has a viewfinder which could either you can either use to look through like this by opening this up here and that of course is not a through the lens viewfinder but this gives you an approximate image or you could use it as a waist level viewfinder where you look through down here and then you see through the lens or you can look at it through, uh, through like, like this. And what's it, what they all have in character thing, they have prisms and mirrors in them. And if you look close enough, you should be able to see that there's a mirror in there. And as I load it up, press the trigger, maybe you'll see the mirror flicking up. I'll just up. Yes, you can see the mirror actually flicking up. So this, you see, is um, an example of a type of camera that started to dominate photography in the latter part of the 1930s. 1930s and 1940s, the single lens reflex camera came into being. Now, I'm talking all the time about miniature cameras, by the way. Now, there were some curious, there were some curious uh, sort of variations on these cameras. People got terribly excited. And I have here, for instance, a stereoscopic miniature camera. So what you would do is you load a film up into this, and when you pressed your button, you would take two photographs simultaneously but because these are spaced out roughly as the way our eyes see them they would then give you two images which you would then look at using a special optical device so you could then have three dimensions as I say this is a curiosity it never became widespread but just to give you another idea of our human ingenuity 
Here I have another camera. Now this is a particularly interesting camera. This was developed in Soviet Russia after the um, uh, in the 90, I think my late 50s, early 60s, and it's called the Horizon. And the reason why it's called the Horizon because when you press the lens. It, the lens actually, there's no shutter in this camera, it actually, the lens swings around. And it has a, it's a panoramic camera, it takes extraordinary photos, and I have many of these that I will be able to show these at some stage. And to this day, I have to tell you, this is, you know, today you set your, your, your phone or whatever you think on pano. This does it in one go and much simpler. This continues to be a significant collector's item. Once again, a specialist type of camera, but with quite a large following in the um, second-hand camera market. Now we move on to the type of a camera which I myself used for many, many years. And this is the type of camera which I, as I said, I bought this in 1982. This is a Nikon. This is my, I, the reason why I like Nikon cameras so much is because they are very versatile. You can change lenses, so you can say you just have a little uh, bayonet fitting lens, but then all camera systems have lenses, of course, of this type. You see, there's a, uh, a that, that was a 24 millimeter lens. I can now slot in a, a 105. This is a portrait lens, etc. And typically, in the days of this type of photography, we would carry three lenses. There was a wide angle lens, there is a, 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 a sort of a slight telephoto or portrait lens, and the normal lens. Now, interestingly enough, this camera, which this film is being made on, also has three lenses and also exactly the same focal lengths approximately. There's an ultra wide angle, about 15 millimeter, there's a 28 millimeter, I think, and there's a 52 millimeter. Very, very similar on today's latest technology cameras, but today we're focusing on the chemical side and the, and the simple optics of cameras of the past. And so this is a Nikon FM2. I still use this. Occasionally, regrettably, I haven't used it enough in recent years, but I have taken thousands upon thousands of photographs with this on film. And this is another Nikon. This is the Nikon F3, which is actually very, very similar indeed. The only difference is, actually, that there's no particular difference I can think of. This one slightly got better shutter speeds and a slightly wider range of things that this could do. By now, these cameras have got not only um, not only is they are they have the, they have, have they got the the prism and the you know you could see through the lens etc. So you can focus exactly, but they've also got built-in light meters. Now light meters are incredibly useful, and the reason why the light meters are incredibly useful is because you don't have to think about how much light your is entering the camera. Now with this type of a camera, you had to actually think of exactly. You had to see whether it's daylight, whether it's sunny, whether you're close up far. There were a whole number of factors which you had to do roughly in your head. I have to say though that the films which we used were very, very tolerable, very tolerant of inaccuracies and you could, you could get a perfectly good result even though you made lots of mis, uh, you know, did, didn't act misjudgments as far as the lighting etc was concerned. But focusing, I'm sorry if you got it out of focus, there is nothing that, uh, that, 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 that you could then do in the darkroom with it. So then I've shown you a few of these cameras um, which, which used photographic film, but of course the great revolution in photography came about approximately 30 years ago. And that was the development of an entirely new range of cameras where the chemistry of the imaging process was totally dispensed of. And that, of course, is electronics. That is the type of the camera that we have today, where there is no chemical reaction involved. It is purely the effect of light on a light-sensitive um, electronic screen of some kind. I have regrettably no idea how it works. And I just have an example of such a camera, which uh, I have used. I've had this for about 10 years, by the way. This is a uh, Nikon, uh, Ni Nikon D20. The lens alone cost £1,500. Unbelievably expensive. But I have to say, this camera has been through thick and thin. If you don't mind, I'm going to take a photograph just now. Ah, there we are. That's just a souvenir for myself of what I've been looking at for the last 20 odd minutes or whatever. So I have a nice photograph that we can see. Unbelievable, and I'm sure you'll all agree with that. You don't have to do much thinking, you just point and shoot the focusing, the light, it's all done for you. 
And today's cameras, which we have in the way, I have the latest state-of-the-art camera here in front of me. I can't remember what it's called, but I did buy it three months ago, and especially for making films like this and for doing photography, it's the latest Apple something or the other. It cost £1,500, so I'm very much hoping that the quality of what you're seeing is of the highest order of technology. And now I'm going to have show you then a little bit about how photography has developed, explain to you the chemistry and the physics of it a little bit in as much as I know. I'm going to finish off now by actually making for you a very simple photographic image using the chemical techniques. Now in these dishes, three dishes here, I have what's known as developer, I have acid stop bath and I have a fixer. And I am going to use two types of photographic paper. I bought them in here and they are both highly sensitive and to light. And I'm going to actually make what's known as popularly as a photogram. It's a very, very simple image where light causes a reaction to take place. And then we can make that image, the image which will excuse me, which will be made, um, will be made permanent by these chemicals. And just to show you, I've got a book here called um, Photographic Chemicals. Before I begin, this is a book called Photographic Chemicals and Chemistry. This was written in 1927, and it does show you um, the uh, diagram of the principal molecule which is found in the developer. As I explained to you earlier, the main process by which a photographic image is made is the reduction of the silver ion Ag plus to an atom of silver Ag. And in the developer here, we have a reducing agent, so substances which do this reduction chemically, which was initiated by light falling upon the film. And I have here on the left hand side, you'll see a diagram of the molecule hydroquinone. Now that's 1,4-dihydroxybenzene, which is the chemical name for it today. It's a, it's a derivative from coal tar. It was made extensively from coal tar during the 19th century, and it is to, today, of course, produced by other means. But hydroquinone, 1,4-dihydroxybenzene, also known as quinone, so three different names, um, is the principal reducing agent which is present in developers. So it enables the silver, which is formed in tiny grains, to grow to be much bigger during the process. Now, Oscar, could I ask you please to come and turn the lights off? Oscar is now going to turn the lights off and I'm going to be working in red lights. These are dark room lights. You, I will take a little while to get accustomed to them. And the reason why I am operating in a red environment is because these two types of paper which I have here are both insensitive to red light. They're called orthochromatic papers. That means you can take them out and the red light will have absolutely no effect on them whatsoever. Now I've got two types, two types of paper here. One of them is a, uh, is a basic photographic paper which is a, from which you make prints by using negatives. But the other one I have is a positive paper, which directly will make you a positive uh, uh, um, a print. So where light falls upon it, it gets lighter. And this is, this is the latter of the two. So this is my, my um, positive paper there, and I'm going to put it down there. And if you don't mind, I'm going to just rapidly, rapidly now uh, put in uh, my sheets of paper here. And, uh, and we have to take care, of course, that we keep the box. Sorry, I'm struggling a little bit. Uh, in, there we are. There is our black light-proof bag here. And I'm just going to now put the lid on here. And out of my other um, box, I have here some Ilford, this is Ilford multigrade paper, which is a traditional type of paper, which has been used when you make prints from negatives. Now, I'll be explaining more about that at future meetings. So here we shall have, we shall now take out a sheet of photographic paper of the normal, the so-called, the normal type. I'm just going to put that down there like this. 
Now, in order to make our photogram, what I'm going to do is I repeat a photograms, not photographs. And indeed, you may do this. These are small experiments, but I just like doing this sort of stuff. You see, I have a, a collection of coins here. I'm going to scatter the coins. I'm sure you can't see them very well in this slide, but who knows, maybe with this latest technology, the lens has adapted that you'll be able to see something. What I'm doing is I'm spreading out the coins on my sheet of uh, paper to make a pattern. I'm making a pattern, just simply any pattern, etc., like that, you see. And then, and now the paper, by the way, you will not be surprised to know, is coated in gelatin, which is a, uh, an organic layer. It's a jelly-like layer. Gelatin stands for jelly-like. And it, ha it is impregnated with silver bromide, among other chemicals, which one which I've mentioned to you already. And I'm now spreading out some other coins here. I'm sure that many of us have all sorts of old coins around in the house from various trips abroad, etc. And some of these coins have unusual shapes. I've actually got a couple with holes in them. So what I've done is I've spread out my coins. And I do repeat, this is an extremely crude experiment. The paper's not exactly flat, it's not perfect, but I'm hoping it will do. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to shine a bright light on it. So here you see, I have a torch and I'm now shining a torch on these coins. Now what I'm going to do, I'm going to move it around a bit. This will diffuse the edges a little bit and it will make the image a little bit peculiar, but it doesn't matter. All I'm trying to do is to illustrate the process itself. Notice, by the way, this paper is pink. It's slightly an unusual color because, uh, as I said, it appears pink in this light, but it is pink. Um, and that's because this is a, a positive paper. Now this type of paper, as I say, is only suitable for, the only children use it in schools. You may have used it yourself, it's used in pinhole cameras for actually for making positive images without the negative in between. Now we're moving on to this paper here. This you see is a traditional paper where you make the image by shining light through a negative. So this is a negative paper. The other one is called a positive paper because it gives you a di direct result. Now I, and I, I can, I'm just shining the light here like that, you see, exposing it um, just a little bit more on here. And what I'm going to do in a second, I'm going to turn off my bright torch, which is, uh, of course, a, 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 the light source I'm using. Once again, a wonderful, wonderful, these uh, LED torches, um, which we have here. By the way, I was given this one as a present um, um, for one of our DT department meetings. Uh, in secret, I know, was from Mr. Alastair Sursok. So thank you, dear Alastair. In your absence, uh, I'm using here a, a piece of uh, a wonderful modern technology. Now, I think I've probably given them enough light. So what we'll now do, we'll scoop out our coins, we'll scoop our coins into the um, into the, the, the bowls, and now we'll start the exciting process, which is developing the image. So I'm going to take this print in here, and I'm going to now hold it up to the camera, and hopefully you'll be able to watch the image coming up. And I can see it coming up from where I am, that's for sure. By God, this is absolutely wonderful. This is such fun. And excuse me, I'm going to grab it, and I very much hope you could see it. There it is. Now that is just a photogram of some coins. If you don't mind, I'm just going to sling that now into my acetic acid um, stop bath. And I'm now going to take the other sheet, which has got coins in there. This, this will be a positive. Now, this, this will, should give a, an image, which is the reverse colors of those. So, fingers crossed, and let's see what happens. Pop this in. Now, I do know from having read the, the, um, what it says on the packaging, that this is less sensitive to light. So this one may take a little longer to come up, but there it is, it's beginning to come up. And lo and behold, what's quite unusual, uh, that this too appears to be um, a negative image. Now, uh, why that's happening, I don't know, but the honest truth is, who cares, it's fun. And as you see, we're developing some sort of a, some sort, maybe I read the instructions or the packaging wrongly, I don't really care, the main thing is I'm having fun, showing you a pretty pattern here, and th this is the genius of the science of chemistry. Once again here, we see chemistry in action, making the, the black, the, the black color is caused 
caused by the um, by the silver grains which are coming out. And if I hold that up, I hope you can see. Let's see if I can just hold it up a little bit better. It's dripping. It's not dripping anywhere on me, or but there it is. You see. So there you see another another photogram. So I'm just going to take this out. Pop this in here now. This you see is called an, an acid stock bar. Oscar, could you switch? Come and uh, turn the lights on for me. Thank you very much. Once once this is in here, you see you can still see the pink color there, and I've done this on purpose. And as I throw it into the fixer, into the fixer, then you will see um, the uh, the colors then become permanent. Now, what's interesting is that this is the amazing thing: is although the coins were lying on top of the paper, you can actually see bits of what was on the coin that was facing downwards, which is absolutely amazing. Now, I'll tell you what, I'm not going to tell you the answer. Can anyone, if anyone can work out how those images have occurred of the face of the coin, which, which no light had access to, then please let me know and I shall explain everything in due course. I've only got one hint to tell you, it's to do with physics and so we are so there we are you see i have shown you here oh by the way i just wanted to show there by the way this one this paper which is supposed to be is called a direct positive paper it hasn't actually given the result but i'm not particularly fast but i will have a look into it but i did find a book here which does actually have such a result and i just wanted to show it for you here it's um, it's another book on um ah uh, uh, here we are yeah, yeah. Now, this is a book, by the way, called The Textbooks of Science, Treatise on Photography. I think this also is early 20th century. But you, here you see, it's got there those two ferns or whatever. One of them is a positive image and the other is a negative. Now, that's what I was hoping to achieve here. But clearly I haven't. But it's of no concern. I shall find out how that is. And next, for the next meeting... Uh, I'm going to show you how we can actually take a normal a photograph. I will actually be using this positive paper, incidentally, and I will be using this camera here to take a portrait of Oscar, and I shall be explaining everything and developing the film in front of you and the paper in front of you, and hopefully, with a bit of luck, we'll end up with a nice portrait. Well, a very, very goodbye to you all. Very, very best wishes for everything that you do, and see you one day. All the best. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching.